kindness is, is probably the most important thing that we give because we, if we, in our minds and if in our hearts, if we're going to living our life, just try and be kind to the person who you're talking. So don't be giving out or saying, oh, it's this, is that. Or, just be kind. In the room, 52 Jokers Wild. Hello, my name is Michael Sullivan. Uh, we're in the room with Gavin and George. Um, some sort of Jokers 52 Wild something. Um, but we're here for now to interview and have a bit of a chat. Yeah. And I'm really looking forward to it. Excellent. Now, Excellent. I'm going straight. You gave me a feed in line before we pressed record, and there's no escaping or getting away from this one. Your AKA, also known as, turns out to be Kringle. Something to do with Kringle. Something to do with Xmas. Father, Father Xmas. What the hell is all that about now? Do you think you're a bit of a Santa Claus? Well, I have been a bit of a Santa Claus for a number of years now. Uh, last year was probably the best. Believe it or not, we did a Zoom Santa Claus with a, a company called Think and Blink. And um, they set up about four rooms in their business premises out in Tala. And it was great. Just go to work there in the morning. Um, and they lined up people. They put you in, into your costume, into your lovely room. I can send you a link to that. I can send you a, uh, a link to the actual. They have a great setup. They normally had about 12 Santis all over Dublin and around. I'm Park so here, jo- jo- Michael, my, no, actually, one thing you haven't been pre-warned about, and you've watched 15 minutes of the show, but you might have been moving through and not realised that I'm on ADHD steroids. I interrupt everybody and everything. The game is to keep yeah. on talking if you can. You may or may not get any questions, but because you're doing us a favour and some other guests dropped out and you don't know what the hell this is all about and you didn't, you volunteered to save our grace. We might, we're actually allowing you to talk a little bit, which is unheard of with the other bunch. But I never get a chance I'm, to no, talk anyway. I know he's, George, he's armed me here. He's armed me in the one sentence ago. You just said the words, Santa Claus, believe it or not. And then followed up by this 12 of us in different rooms. God forbid any poor kid start watching this program and realise there's 12 Santa Clauses, <laughs> they, believe it or not, Hello. locked into different rooms in Dublin somewhere and the links can be provided afterwards. Do you believe or not there, Mike? Oh, of course I do. We're only, we're only uh, pretending to be the real something. You're believe actors, you're actors. You're back to this acting actors, stuff. Actors, actors. <laughs> uh, actors, yeah, yeah, that, I suppose. Yeah, but yeah, all actors are pretending. Yeah. Every actor's out playing uh, having the crack. That's really what it is. Acting is all about playing. Now, I'm going to bring was- up your namesake because we asked a good friend of ours from, well, we only know him for about an hour exactly, which was the last show, <laughs> Aidan <laughs> O'Sullivan. I asked him for a favour and he pulled a Michael O'Sullivan out of the hat. I go, Jesus, it's not the whole family, is it? Is he going to bring his daddy on here now? <laughs> and then he says, no relation. No. Well, are you telling me really, there's no relation? About, about uh, my great, 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 great grandfather yeah. and his great, 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 great grandfather were brothers. And mine stayed in Kerry and his went to Donegal. Right. That's so he's lying to us already. Uh, uh, so yeah, there yeah, is a relation. Family relation. Yeah. Every O'Sullivan is related. Every O'Sullivan is related. Yeah. You have to go back to a, a few generations before we catch up. This is well, something actually, we love. Actually, there, there is this, there's another Kings North in Ireland who lives in Galway, a guy called Paul Kings North. It turns out it's 12 generations ago that we were actually linked yeah. together. We, and then we sort of went our separate ways. But we yes, every Kings North, like every O'Sullivan, is related, not the O'Sullivan's to Kings North. <laughs> now, what you have accidentally introduced, Michael, is, is we have had this is our hundred, I think it's our hundred third show or hundred and second. It's about and, 104th, actually. All right, hundred and fourth. God, we lose count after the first six. He's an accountant but, and he can't even count. <laughs> but w- one of the shows and one of the common themes is is again, I don't know if you know Douglas Adams and the fundamental interconnectedness of all things and serendipity and the universe provides what you want. But what's in there is there's also the six degrees of separation. And we mentioned in Ireland, it's probably three and a half. Everybody knows everybody. And not only do you know them, go back one generation, they're related to them. So it's Ireland is a small country. So the question is, do you know Santa Claus? Yes, I do. I know him personally very, very well. That's what we he were talking about. We talked about to be Santa Claus when I claim, you know. Now, <laughs> actually, another thing here is we asked Aidan, your, your namesake, you're an actor. I asked him, are you a thespian or an actor? And Panto appeared in the middle of that. Where the hell does Santi fall in that triptych in your books? I think it's a biographical actor. You know, you're playing a real person, you know. 
Right. I like the answer. So he's, you're not Panto and Santi. It's not a Tesman. No, he's the, you're actually playing the man. Now, that's... Yeah, it's unusual when you're playing somebody real and who's still alive, you know? Yeah. So that's, that's the difference. No, no, no. So you're, is, you're, it, is it Santa Claus? Is it St. Nicholas? Or is it Father Christmas? I go for Santa Claus. Santa Claus. Now, I, actually, I'm going to play with this one, George. You gave me a view of a lead-in because I actually, you, you asked, you, you hit the double accent, but I actually live in Thomastown. And in Thomastown, there's a place called Jerpoint Park. And what they found in Jerpoint Park <laughs> is actually St. Nicholas's grave. So I have to tell children that come to visit this house, Santy's buried up the road there, six foot under. Right? So is it St. Nicholas? Is it Coca-Cola red and white? Which one do you believe in? I believe St. Nicholas and the Coca-Cola. No, it's just funny you mentioned Jerpoint that I drove down to Waterford to see a very good friend of mine, David Hayes, who's a musical director from uh, River Dance all the way up to The Voice. And and he was having a night with David Hayes down in uh, Waterford. And I got my youngest daughter. She was doing her test last Tuesday. Unfortunately, she didn't pass. But we drove down. I let her drive down her little car. Yeah. And we drove down past Jerpoint Abbey to Thomastown. Because I was in Thomastown a couple of years ago doing a, um, uh, a film for the, from, from the students from Carlo. And when you go to Thomastown, you're heading for Waterford. Just as you come over the bridge and, turn, and you head for Waterford, there's a left turn up the road that heads for New Ross. And the first little house up there, we filmed there one day. We did all the shots there and then went to a farm. And so I was down in Thomastown and we passed through it and Jerpoint Abbey. Uh, oh, isn't that serendipity it. for you, me living in Thomastown? Oh, We're going to be oh, filming in Thomastown. Oh, and our academy is based in Thomastown. <laughs> I think Thomastown, And I think it. we're going to invite Santi in his little red car to come oh, back at a later date and do a bit of river dance. And we'll take yeah. it. You know, so... Yes, that sounds good, yeah. I go for that. Well, that's on. That's on. That's on the cards now. We're not going to move. more authentic up. than what the what my link is because uh, you know uh, we did something for rhythm of the dance. <laughs> we ended up going all around France and no, Holland doing doing filming of this rhythm of the dance. It was uh, I can't believe it's not river dance. Too. Is what you're saying? I know. Yeah. So, this is, I can't believe it's not river dance. <laughs> it didn't taste as butterly as that though. <laughs> now, Michael, you're a very um, accommodating you know you got three and a half seconds notice and you stood up or you sat down i don't know what happened i don't even know where you were at the time you got the call <laughs> and you said i'll go on national we, no, it's we're going to use this language of well national it's not national, national tv we don't know what this is this is going out to the universe we're on every channel you can think of podcast wise and spotify to itunes and god knows Wash. We're also in the LinkedIn space and Facebook space. We don't know how many customers we have. We have three or four. I think Aiden has won them. You watch 15 minutes. We don't even know you're going to go back and watch anymore. Now, we actually <laughs> might get you as a customer because you're going to watch an hour of it. You're going to watch yourself. Do you like watching yourself? I don't mind watching myself. I've, I, 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 I say and I have a laugh about it. I have a high opinion of myself. And that's not in any sort of uh, elite, um, egotistical way. I'm but you, but you have to be, you have to when you fly around in those sleighs with the old reindeers, because I mean, that's you've got to have a you know a thing for heights. Yeah, I have a, I have a good head for heights, all right, with my eyes closed. And um, so I'm, I'm going, but anyway, I go, I um, I have a very so through lockdown, nothing really bad happened to me. I was comfortable in my own skin, don't mind being on my own. Um, we used to go out walk and practice in my story, do a bit of storytelling. And, practicing my stories and practicing my songs that I sing. And so it was, it was no difficulty to me. You gave you know, me you've just me. given me a little, I like that. I like that. But again, I, what happens with me is, and my kids say, it, I grab a word and then I go for it. And they're going, dad, we can't finish a second sentence with you. Because once you hear one word, you grab it. And then you're going, I'm, I have, we haven't even said what we're going to say. But you just gave me, I'm comfortable in my own skin. And I'm going, what other feckin' skins have you been in? that you weren't comfortable in and therefore which skin did you not like that much and why not? Well, the thing about it is that I only have one set of skin and I'm comfortable in it. The problem is that a lot of people are not comfortable in their own skins. Yeah. Well, whose yeah. skins they are they comfortable in if they're not comfortable in their own skin? 
the only part, it's like being dealt a set of cards. You know, when you get the cards at the start of your life, people want to change the cards. And you can only I play love the it. Cards. You were listening. I told you 52 Jokers Wild was the card you were dealt. <laughs> and now you're absolutely. saying, if you're not comfortable in the skin you were dealt, you've got to become a Joker. And then you're the chameleon and you can change your skin. Well, that, that actually brings us back to the Avatar thing as well, doesn't it? Well, I just said the chameleon is not comfortable in his own skin because he keeps on fucking changing it. Yeah. yeah. And I like that. That's the whole point. Now, well, actually... We're, we're also talking about avatars quite a lot because uh, obviously we are, we're into sci-fi and the same kind of thing as well. But w- what's interesting there is that a lot of people have spent their time uh, during the lockdown in an avatar as well. And that's, that's, that's quite interesting. You're, you're saying you're happy enough in your own skin. You're happy enough who you are as a person. And we've, we've, We've known a few a few actors that that they're hiding. They may be hiding in their own skin, but they don't want the real inner self to be revealed. How, how do you, how have you sort of coped then with with that process during lockdown? What what how do you think that's that's you're you're different to maybe some of the other people that are actually struggling? Because there's going to be a lot of people needing counselling over the next few years, I think, because of the lockdown. Well, I- well, for me, I think the, the problem is that people are not comfortable in their own skin. They live in the eyes of others. You know, they, they live their life compared to what that person says. And my mother would was the first of it, I could say, you could see. She used to say, fix those curtains, what will the neighbours say? Yes. You know, so she was living her life compared to what the neighbours were going to think of her. And I suppose through all I suffered with depression and went through a few bad times, went out twice to commit suicide. I didn't fucking succeed, as you probably know. Um, but going through all that shit and all the bad times, I came out the far, time, far side now that I don't take any tablets because I realised that you have to be comfortable in your own skin. That yeah. You don't live according to what other people say or think. And um, I try to impart this to people, especially when I'm working with the students, the young people, yes. is to impart that. We should be all taught that in school, how to be comfortable in our own skin. How do we hang, handle anger and sadness and uh, upset? You know, what do we do when these things happen? We were never taught that. The ordinary things of life. Yeah. And I would have loved to go into schools and just to say to people, you know what I mean? That you really are good it's people. It's okay. Don't care yeah. what people think. Yeah. It's yeah. okay to be whatever way you are. It's okay. Actually, yeah. Michael, the weird thing is you brought up a couple of things from the last show that even Aiden touched on. And it's it's okay to be you. That, that's fine. Come yeah. from your own skin. Yeah. That's the skin you were dealt you don't. You can change it. What's what we're saying? It's it's the clothes you put on. It's the manner you sir, pursue. It's the training you you you, de- you can develop your skin. You can make it shine. You can polish it. But you know, no. I, the terrible me. I'm not PC. I will bring it left field. You took another couple of lines in there. I know it's a very very important subject, but I can't help myself, and I have to apologize in advance. You said your mother put oh, It's all about the curtains and the neighbors looking in. And the weird thing is, you're saying, what will the neighbours think? Now, if you take, you just said before you went to that other delicate area, there are no, cur- no curtains, take it off. If you're comfortable in your own skin, you're damn naked. And what you're doing, you're now becoming an exhibitionist and let the fucking see. And what the devil I care if you do. So indirectly, we're saying, get comfortable in your own skin. You don't need, you don't need curtains. You can be an exhibitionist because this is your planet, your time, your universe is all about you and how you interact with it. So I can see a naked Santa Claus in the future coming down the line a little bit. It's not well, it's dangerous I, territory. I, I'm actually going to go. I, could do that. I have to go into the sun because I don't take the sun at all. I just grow red. So I go for a, one of these places and get sunned up completely red and just wear a black belt and a hat. Right, you're doing <laughs> Santa Claus Baywatch <laughs> now with his little light That's for <laughs> But, but I think one of the problems is that if so many people start to think, what do other people think of me constantly? They're always inward looking. And that's the way it gets very destructive. I think once you've got to a point where you can look outward, you're no longer worrying about yourself. You're actually there helping other people to, to meet their needs. And that's, that's where I think is, is a better place to be, which is what really the Santa Claus is really about. It's, it's, it's actually opening up to other people's needs not to worry about who you are and what you're about, but to to help those other people start to see what life could be about if they weren't overly thinking about themselves. I think that's no, really. No, I, I think the Michael's area. already. Actually, that's no. We we've talked. We 
we can't let yeah. go of Santi for a first song, which we have to because you've, you 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 gave us that on the on the way in. <laughs> <laughs> but we, you know, just we just kind of let go of it now because you're dressed in red. You've got the full regatta. You're going to go off and get a job in it. But forget that for a second. I like what George is saying. Santi was about no, it's about a multitude of things, but was giving of gifts. You know, so if if and and what we don't know you from what we said this to Aiden, we don't really know you. You stepped in thirty seconds. You're playing, you're pressing record, and we said we're in the virtual pub. And what we're trying to do here is make friends and influence people and find out a little bit about each other. And take the piss where we can because that's our job but, in the pub environment. There, there, but, just very quickly, there's the gift, the Santa's yeah. gift that came to us on this no, show. No, but Michael, I was trying to get that in my long winded about way because I sort of now heard what you said. You said you're a storyteller, you're a sing, you, I did, you, you, you're a musician, storyteller, actor. And what you're doing is you're trying to give happy times, good times of yourself and your skill set to others to bring them away from where you've been so they don't go there. So, I mean, and, and I think that's that's really the takeaway that's really happening now. I realise that your acting is, 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 I mean, I haven't, I don't know what you, ha- we asked Aiden, have we seen you in anything? You know, maybe we haven't, maybe we have, but somebody has, and they got enjoyment from whatever you did. And that's your, your of a given nature, and you're giving your skin to others, and it, it's that, your learnings and your earnings, and, and that that's an interesting sort of way of looking at it as well. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Um, I'll tell you something else. Um, you, where well, you might have seen me. Um, do you remember the two men who got married to avoid tax? Yes. Oh right, that's me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right now I like it is a, hello we've got a guest, Good guest. You know, somebody <laughs> might know you you know you have friends it gets oh, better. Yeah. no 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 <laughs> right no also the strange thing is Michael we 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 had a couple of people want, wanting to be on the show and other people we were asking and we were because we're novices we're going you, it's that insecurity you're starting to go oh oh they've yeah. got names and they're well known and and then we're starstruck and then the, the, we, we realize that we need to find the ordinary man and woman because the, what our journey is about is is the unknown to the known. It's the fact it's we need to bring people on a journey, not the ones of success we navigate it unless they want to give back, which might help us do like facilitate that type of thing. So actually, I, I think I read it. I think everyone in this country, unless they were deaf, dumb, and blind, and even if they were deaf, dumb, and blind, someone used braille and used sign language. And knows of your story, and, and I think yeah. it's one that. And I'm an accountant, and I go, "Yep, that fucking tax man and heard and stuff." And I think it's one of the <laughs> loveliest stories of this last couple of years. That I says, that is especially to beat the tax man. Jeez, that was brilliant. You go, but that aside, two friends. You know, I mean, people will know and they can find out themselves because we're not fucking advertising you anyway. But it's a <laughs> night. It's it's. It's not your show. It will be, it will be your fucking show if we start going down the route of that well, story. Actually, <laughs> I like I, I'm, it curious, I I'm curious it for those brilliant. people that don't know the story. Tell us the story because I don't know if I know the story. Other people, because obviously I'm coming from north of the border. And once you get north of the border, everything goes dark up here and you don't really get to see that many things. And we become very isolated. Tell us a little bit about that story. Just for those well, audience uh, that don't know. Is that... Um, a friend of mine, Matt Murphy, I knew him from Aircom. I used to work in Aircom before I became an actor. And uh, I know him about 30 years. And I got in touch with him again. He retired, but I kept kind of in touch. And then I kind of lost. I was in two relationships and separated twice. And I got in touch with him again. I started bringing him out to some of my, uh, when I go to the sessions and all that. And he really an enjoyable company. He's a great, he was a great character. Yeah. So uh, he unfortunately was starting to lose his sight. And unfortunately, I lost my apartment to the bank. So I was at times living in my car at the back of the airport up, up near um, Stunabay. And Matt said to me, he says, look, why don't you come over here and live with me? You'll have somewhere to live and I won't have to go into a home because the site was getting poor. You can look after me. And I said, that's a brilliant idea. Yeah. And he said, I can't pay you. But what I'll do is I'll give you the house when I die. Small little two bedroom college in Stony Ballard. And I said, that's brilliant. I said, it's a great idea. I said, but you know, I'll have to sell it immediately because of the inheritance yeah, tax. Yeah, madness. Yeah. And Terrible thing. So then he was talking to a friend of his down the country, and uh, an elderly, not an elderly lady, she's young at heart completely, but in her mid, mid to late 70s, and a real character. And she says, Ah, oh, Jesus, Matt, the only thing you can do is get married. This was back in 2017. And, Matt, <clears throat> and then thought about it, and he said, 
geez, maybe we'll do this for the So we said we'd do it for the crack. I told my three children, my eldest said, be very careful what you're doing, because yeah. if you're saying you're getting married to avoid tax, that could be an illegal statement. Like in America, yeah. if you say, I'm getting married to, to get a green card, yes. that's an illegal statement to be deported. So we yeah. kept it very quiet. But Matt was listening to the Joe Duffy show, and uh, they were giving out horribly about the HSC, that it was a useless organisation. So Matt had got great uh, help from the HSC. They brought him back to life after he nearly died in 2010 from a heart complaint, and they found this eye problem that he had, and he lost about half his sight. But after a while, they found out what was wrong, and they brought him in and operated him within 12 hours. So he wanted to get on to Joe Duffy and say, look, hang on a second, the HSC is not all that bad. So we got on, and as he's chatting to the researcher who takes your name and all that information, uh, he just said to her, do you want to laugh? And she said, yeah, go on. He says, I'm 85 and getting married next week. And she said, Jesus, tell Joe. And Matt said, no, 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 Jesus, I'm only, I'm only giving you a laugh. But Joe comes on and said, no, Matt, we've 85, getting married. What's this all about? And Matt said, look, he said, I didn't ring for that. I rang to talk about the HSC. So Joe says, go ahead. So he gives the speed about the HSC, but Joe comes back and says, no, Matt, you're getting married next week. Who are we getting married to? He says, I'm getting married to my best friend in care, Michael O'Sullivan, to avoid inheritance tax. He said over the air. So... <laughs> All the newspapers, the story went worldwide. We were back on the Joe Duffy show the following week, just a week before Christmas, on the Clareborn Live TV show, interviewed by Sky News, New York Times. The story went as far as China and Japan and Malaysia, oh, wow. and the, whole, the whole world. And someone said you should do a documentary. So someone tried to help us do a documentary, a fellow called Don Maloney. And he, we only met him on Wednesday and we were getting married on Friday. <laughs> <laughs> you're getting married you better record Michael, the, the we're not, there's no way I'm going to be getting married to you a second time now you get divorced it's, it's we, now, we, now to, we need to get into the church on time <laughs> so, anyway, um, uh, so anyway we started doing the documentary but uh, no one would support him no one would give him any money but he still kept on uh, videoing us over the years and unfortunately poor Matty died last September last January, 12 months, on the 14th. Oh. And even up to last uh, December, we were still filming, believe it or not. But the story, the, the, the um, documentary went out in January this year and in June of this year. And it got huge praise. It more people watched it than The Late Late Show. And we were number one on Twitter and all this type of thing. Because it's just, if you get a chance, it's called Let the Rest of the World Go By and it's on the RT player. Well worth having a look. Lovely. Oh, yes, definitely. 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 Oh, absolutely. No, Michael, as oh. said, you know, See, that's the thing. We wouldn't know who's sitting. I said, you can have the world star sitting in front of us. And I wouldn't recognize any of them. I wouldn't know. That, yeah. Who walks into a pub? It's like Bono is about five foot three. He's a god on the stage. But if he's in the pub beside you, you go, who's the man with the wig? You, go, you, don't, you, don't, you don't associate because it couldn't be where you are. And therefore, you couldn't be in this show. You couldn't be. You're, you're actually worldwide known, recognized. No, absolutely. We have a show with three customers, potentially. <laughs> and you've you've gone off and conquered the world you've by saved accident. the show yeah. as well. Yeah. No, <laughs> and as I said, no. Again, you've made a document. The weird thing is, there was a journey they couldn't write, wrote itself in real life. That and even say, actually, I know for my sister when she was a student, and and her and a, a friend of mine moved in. They were studying in the same place, and they got a they got an apartment together. And the tax man immediately said, your common law husband and wife, they didn't even know each other. There was two separate bedrooms. They were going to two different colleges. And the, so there's, the weird thing is it works in their advantage going, you can't have anything from us for the social welfare otherwise because your common law husband and wife taking care of each other. So had you been woman and man in that house, they would have assumed you were common law husband and wife had you been looking for assistance, which is crazy. Now you're going, you legitimately did it and went through the documentation it don't, it can't, it, it, because it was legitimate, it doesn't need to be consummated or this and the other. It's like, you can say what you said. It wasn't. You went through the actions. You did what I said in the day. Yeah. You moved in together. You took care of each other. You signed the documents. They can't take that away from you. And therefore, even saying it out, it wasn't, the, it wasn't to avoid, the, the language that was lost in accounting language, because I'm an accountant, is evade as opposed to avoid. You weren't trying to evade inheritance tax. You were trying to avoid inheritance tax. And that was legal. Hmm. Well, that's it. So you think about um, people, and I've mentioned his name, Michael O'Leary. You know, he pays this, the equivalent of a normal man's uh, tax. That's it. And yet he's earning an awful lot more. You know, he's a, he's a billionaire, but he's able to do that. You know, I was even afraid to get the... Um, 
uh, the carer's allowance yes. because if I had to take the carer's allowance it would have brought Matt above a threshold maybe he only but he yeah. lose his medical card or do yeah. this he or something lose the card and all his free things that he got you know so I didn't do that so I didn't mind doing it and we got great support from someone like Michal McDowell Michael McDowell wrote a nice piece in the Irish Times to say to supporting us saying that we were doing nothing illegal that's in what we were doing because but people are afraid no one's going to help you no one's going to the, the well, great thing about yeah. it is you act you found yourself going on that journey and people, you said it by a joke and someone else could formalize and say, actually, that's a brilliant idea. Yeah, now, there's an awful yeah. lot of people out there that are lo- just no one there to help them, no one to point the way they didn't really. Actually, most people I come across, you have those that take from the state and are, are no, it's generational and they know how to abuse and screw the system. There's well, others the that can't thing. even access the system. Yeah, here's the daft thing. I, I, my wife and I have been married 34 years, okay? And uh, about a year after we got married, uh, we ended up in Norwich. Uh, Trish is a nurse. So she worked in, in uh, she, she was allowed to have a, a room in the nurse's home. Now, I had nowhere else to go. So I had to go and stay. I stayed on the floor in the nurse's home. But we were basically told if they found out that I was there with her, she'd get kicked out. I'd get kicked out. And the only way we could get a house is if I went to the authorities and said that we were separated and getting divorced. And I'm sitting there kind of going, this is completely loopy. This is absolutely mad. We're a young couple trying to be together. And because of circumstances, we're being forced to use a nursing home or, or the nurse's home, rather, to stay in a, a single room. And if, if we got found out being married, we'd have both been kicked out of the flipping place. It's, it just seems <laughs> daft, doesn't it? You know? This, this is the thing. If you're in, this is this is a problem I have with the government as well, especially with, with if you're entitled to something, and you don't know you're entitled to it, the government will not give it to you unless you ask. Yeah. And I think that is fucking disgrace. Because if you're entitled to it, and entitlement means that regardless of whether you know about this, you're entitled to it means you're due to be given. So the government should be just ringing you up and saying, "Do you know?" For example, um, someone afterwards asked me. Are you going for the widow's pension? Now, the, the reason I'm saying this is because when we were living in the house, Matt was earning an awful lot more than me because he had an aircon pension and his old age pension. I had a disability, small disability pension from aircon because I left due to my ill health, mental uh, ill health. And um, so when he died, more than half the money that was coming into the house, I got, it was now gone out of the house. And somebody then said to me, are you going for the widow's pension? And I'm going... I thought that was an archaic pension that was there years ago for women couldn't work and all that. I was like, that's what it was. I was just like, never heard. Ring up social welfare. So rang up social welfare. It's now called something like um, the spouse, the, what was it, the spouse's pension or something yeah. like that. It's not yeah. called widowed. Yeah. Yeah. So I just said, can I get this? And so I always send you a form, see if you're entitled to it. So I then filled it in and sent it back. And I was getting a couple of hundred euro a week, which kept me buoyant. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it was brilliant. a strange one, Michael. I worked in Aircom 20 years ago. Now, the same Where? place. Well, I worked in Cumberland, Gaiety, Stevens Green, up like every, everywhere you could think of, I was there at some stage in finance. But um, no, I just, I just, rem- and I was on the trustee of the pension board, by the way. So they didn't want me there. I was voted in by the people, by the workers. <laughs> the management didn't like it because I kept, I wouldn't shut up. I kept on asking questions. They just wanted to have coffee and muffins and sign off on things. But I was going, where's the workers' rights? What's this? Now, what's interesting, what you just said is, and I know if your partner was there in the defined benefit scheme, this is a very technical talk on our show now. Yeah. There is actually a widow's pension. You're entitled to his pension, widow's pension. No, I'm not. Because someone said that to me. Again, was someone nice came along and said that to me. And I checked into it. And what happened was in the is they it in the 80s? In the eight, yeah. They swapped it in the 80s. And because Matt wasn't married and wasn't expecting himself to ever get married, yeah, he decided to stay in the old one. So there was no uh, widows and or orphans. He just stayed with his own He was in the right, gotcha. Yeah. No, I mean, there's a race. Where's, where's, no, again, I'm going back to serendipity and bringing it back from a different place to a different place going... You were in well, just before now. we worked just before in Aircom. <laughs> yeah, well, I, actually, because I, I keep that thought in your head there, Gavin, because I want to go back to this one because what there's some really interesting stuff that's actually coming out here about pensions and you know, like I'm married, my wife's married, my wife's been in a job as well for a long period of time. Um, 
but there's a good possibility that when one of us dies, the other doesn't carry on getting the pension because they've changed the rules yeah. in, in the North. And yet that's, that's a significant income drop that could mean that somebody, especially a pensioner, could find, suddenly find themselves being able to cope, not being able to cope, and then lose their home and where they're about to live because they've suddenly dropped below that threshold. So it's a fairly significant thing that a lot of young people – aren't aware of because they try they you know, to save money, especially with the way, the way things are having to go with mortgages and things, they, they forget about their pensions. And yet those sort of things are so important to have in place later on now, in life. When, yeah. George, so, the weird thing is, I know, I know there's, not, there's a question there and it's not a question there. The danger is we go into a different show and it's political. And it's a, this is a film business show. Yo, I'm going to swing back around and go. But well, think what about is all those filmmakers that need no, pensions. No, what is relevant <laughs> of what we came across yeah. in an awful lot of the individuals was they barely have a job in the year. Mm. They're working project to project. Absolutely. God forbid you put the mental health issue of thinking of the pension aspect of something when they don't even have the capability of having a mortgage aspect because of the continuity. So this is a very, very difficult industry to plan unless you're getting a job in it for life. If you're a self-employed actor or producer, director, project to project, it's very difficult to plan where the hell yes. you're going to be next, what you're doing, and the financing of the future, and even the present. So that would bring in an awful lot of the issues you're talking about. Yeah, and I think I've gone through that because of my career being in it. I've had jobs and I've had, you know, I've been doing freelance. I've gone from a full-time job, let's say, for the BBC to freelancing for a good period of time. To, to another full-time job in education and then back to freelancing again. And you don't know where things are going to go and where how things are going to pop up. Maybe the Santa Claus gig is, is a fairly regular one, at least at the, during the winter. Well, months. I think San, the weird thing is, Michael, your story is inspirational on the base. Of, it is. Look, even, even in two minutes, you said, I, I'm only starting to realize some of what you've gone through. Gone, I live in a car. I was lucky to have this person that was helping out one way and gave back more yes. than I was ever giving. And this whole, your security of the, of, of, you had things, had you not known that one person, as you said, you commit, you tried to commit suicide twice. You were in a bad space. That, that space was not improving at that point in time in the absence of this brand new relationship type structure that went on a different journey and solved a hundred different types of problems and now has empowered you. I think the strange thing is he's empowered you to be Santa Claus. He's actually yeah. given you the power of security of the house, a little bit of income, security, and, and, re, and you're now realizing where you are going, I've got to give back. I've got to give the gift back. Yeah. And, yeah, that, that's, and what that's you're doing and what you're talking about from stories to singing to dancing to acting, you're enjoying the journey of trying to give someone else security, possibly. I don't know. Well, well I, I'm very lucky. I give thanks every day. I've got a photograph of Matty outside here, and I give thanks to him every day because of what he's done for me. Mm. And I love going out working with the students. A lot of other actors now don't go out. Aiden's the same. Mm. We go out work with the students because you don't get anything, but you're giving something to them. Yeah that they might need. And of course, I'm very fit and upfront when it comes to giving them help. Sometimes, you know, we have a little... You have to shove it sometimes. down our throat sometimes, Michael. That's what you're saying. Yeah. You yeah. just, but in other words, I also help them with their self-esteem. Yeah. Because a lot of these young people, that they struggle with that. And I, and I do tell them the story. I, I, you know, they have to be able to look in the mirror every morning and look at themselves and say, Michael, I love you. Mm. And I was oh, just so I can go back a sentence. Just, no, you're telling yeah. me a bunch of kids are looking in the mirror and they go, Michael, I love you. <laughs> right? <laughs> like how you have them well trained. I like that. I like that. Oh, absolutely. No, actually, I'm going to go one better, Michael. What you have to tell them is to look in the mirror and go and see Santa Claus and go as themselves <laughs> and go, I that you could that he could be the ultimate giver, that he could be they can be this nice person, this. They don't have to see evil, don't have to see bad. They've got to see a Santa Claus-esque something looking back at themselves, and that would be great. Well, the thing, it's to actually feel that about themselves. I went to see Damien Dempsey's concert, you know, it's called Love Yourself Today. And that's just a line in one of the songs, that you have to love yourself today. And these young people are not ever taught that. Yeah. They're not taught to say, yeah. I'm fucking good. Because I, I, I have my, my two daughters are great at it, especially my youngest. Because I've been chatting to my youngest daughter. She's 25 now. She's very cuddly type of 
lovely. Don't tell person. me she has a she, fucking white beard and a red outfit. No, you mean? <laughs> like, she's working on it. But I, I just say, well, when I'm ending the call, I tell her I love her. She says I love Mac, and I say, what are you, Shelley? And she goes, I am the best, and I know she means yeah. it. And it's not saying she's better than anybody else. It's just fail. She's the best that she can be. Yeah. My eldest daughter started to say more. My son is the hardest because I said to him, what are you? He goes, I'm a, I'm a man. I'm, I'm good. You know, he hasn't got this thing where he says, I am the best. Yes. That, that feeling about yourself, that you feel good about yourself. And it, that's so important because it's not taught to you at all. And to, anytime I get out with these young people, that's the thing I teach them. I you know, them Michael, you're reflecting what we even, even Aiden show. Yeah. You're going, we said yeah. in there, I, I am what I am. I'm Popeye to say you're a man. No, I am. If we are in the I am, we're in the now. And if and what was in that show, a little piece of it was, are you the best you you can be? You can be yes. good, you can be great, you can be anything you want to be, but it's up to you to do it. You know, other people yeah. can't be, you, other people, it's like the skin again, you're going, I can't step into your skin and wear it. Now, other people can be a better me than I can. That's what we were talking about in the show. Or they can't, if they were an actor. So if I was Tom Hanks, who's going to play Tom Hanks in a movie? Are, is he going to be better than the Tom Hanks playing Tom Hanks, the, 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 the making a Tom Hanks movie? So you, we're all, we all need to be Santa Claus. We all need to be the best us we can be. And that's good enough because that's, we're the only person that can play that role. And if we're just in the, in the now and we're being the best we can be right now, then we all, as George said in the show, we're the best we can ever be because we are it now. You know, I think and, it's and, also, I think it's also important to, to, although we're the best that we possibly can be, it's, it's about building those relationships. And it is also about passing it on, which is really what this story is about. It's about passing something on to other people and, and giving in that way, which is which is, the, which is what your friend has actually done for you. And you're, again, reflecting that back to all these other people. And it's in that giving to the, even to your youngsters, because I know, I know what you're saying. I, uh, I had to go and build a computer this last week. My, my son had actually got me all set up. So he had then said, look, Dad, if you want help, come up and see us. So I went up and I was his assistant. I, I was saying, uh, you know, 16 years ago, I he assisted me in building his first computer. And now 16 years later, he was he was the one building the computer and I was just assisting him. I was giving something back to him. But it was just the way that we were kind of working together. You suddenly realized, you know what? Those relationships in, in families and friends, long-term friends, those developments in those relationships are so important because you never know who's going to need who later on in, in life. I don't know when someone's going to, I'm going to need somebody to, to be there for me in the same kind of way that you did. So if, while I am able to, while I am, you know, literally able-bodied at the moment because we're all tabs, as they call them, isn't it? Temporarily abled person kind of thing, or able-bodied rather. I'm I'm that at the moment, but who knows for how long? And that I'm going to be in the I'm going to be in that sort of need position where I'll need someone else to give me that support and that help. And hopefully, if I can give that at this point, that's the best I can actually do. That's that's really what this story is about. Yeah, and and also there's a thing about you know if if you help somebody and then they help you back, that's a closed loop. But if you there's a famous film years ago with Kevin pay Spacey. It and, sorry, pay sorry, it forward, sorry, sorry, pay it forward. Is it? And <laughs> yes, that's, that's it. Pay it forward. That if you help somebody, and your idea is instead of you helping me back, where does it? It ends there. If you help somebody forward yes. and it keeps on going forward. Yes. That's where the help goes. And eventually Mike come back around to you. I was waiting 60 matter. seconds ago, Mike. I was going, yeah, you went on to the conversation yourselves. I was going, I'm going to bring up pay it forward because that's what I'm hearing. <laughs> yeah. And I'm going, no, I'm just changing it. And another bit of what you were talking about was, and maybe the hardest thing for people out there and young people, especially is it's very difficult to ask for help. Now, the, yeah. I think what's great is you're recognizing they need it and you're giving it to them whether they want it or not. Because they, you're paying, you're for, you're playing it forward and paying it forward, and you're not treating it as 
you know, so, uh, you know, an answer to an ask. You know, no, you're you're giving. So it wasn't asked for. You're giving help. You're paying it forward. You're giving it beyond your our own means. Nearly, you're going. And actually, we had a conversation before you came on today. Going where people there's enough other takers out there, and there's other ones that are givers, but they're yeah. giving what they don't have enough of. You don't. You want to be giving of your excess, not giving of what you have, because then you dilute and you and you can't keep on giving. So you, what your thing is is great in the sense of. You, you're now attracting others, I think, that will see how you're setting the example of how to give. and But mm. we also have to build a machine that can keep on giving. And therefore, it can become self-sustaining. And actually, the machine is nearly those individuals in the machine. Your partner gave gave to, more to you than, than, than you. I'm not, not saying there's a, an amount, but he, you're empowered beyond a timeline. He's gone now. You, you feel empowered to give more than you originally had to others that maybe can't ask and need it. And therefore, and I think it's lovely what you're doing. And, and it's something hopefully we're, we, we have in our own ethos that we want to get ourselves in a position that we can support scholarships and people mm. in our college, get the disenfranchised, the diversity. It's the ones that need it most are the ones that can't afford it. The ones that, but the way it works is someone else needs to be paying because it's a cost. But it's who gets and who gives don't need to be the same individuals. So, you know, type of thing. Yeah, but it also that the, that the giving of something. The problem I had, a, a lot of people, for, former friends of mine, uh, kind of said that I was actually just going after Matt for his money. Mm -hmm. And I lost a whole bunch of friends because somebody decided to tell me that that's what they all thought. And when the, on the Tuesday before we got married, they rang in the HSC. And they said to the HSC, this man is only doing this to rob Matt. And uh, oh the goodness. HSC then had to actually give Matt a compass mentis test the day yeah. before the wedding. You know, but the thing is that people sometimes see that the only thing he can give is money, as in currency. But the, that money is not the only currency. There's time. Yeah. It's There's output. Yeah. That's, a, that's, not, yeah. that's the evidence. It's not the, as you said, you gave up your life. You didn't know how long it was going to be. You support yeah, I had no money. I had no money. I was sleeping in the back of the car. I had a fucking six and a half thousand pound credit card bill. When the bank took my house and my apartment, they sold it for less than it was worth. Yeah. And they came after me then for the 50,000 difference between the value of the house and the value of the mortgage. And I was left bereft at the time. Now, fortunately enough, I was in here. I still had a great deal of belief in myself. So I was not under a huge amount of pressure from myself. But then when Matt did this, he helped me out of the hole that I was in. Yeah. I was able to help him with my time. I couldn't help him with finance, but he helped me with finance because he had a few bob and I didn't, mm. you know. So we, he helped me here, brought me in here, and then I looked after him. Because, I mean, it got down to 24-hour care where he was getting a bit of dementia, didn't know where he mm. was, he was getting incontinent, and you just have to go through these times, you know. Yeah. I mean, that's Michael, the word, you keep on using the word, which is a very, very important word, time. And we, we, in a lot of our shows, the most valuable thing on the planet is your time. And some people say it's cost 10 quid an hour and 50 quid. No, the most, you, you, based on where we are in our lifetime that's left of when we're compass mentors or otherwise, you've given of what you had, which is the most valuable, your time. You've directed it in terms of his care and need and in your own, like in your own by default. And there was no amount of money you could pay. Actually, that's what we said in the very first show we yeah. said, your, your man, Steve Jobs, had billions. And he said, I would give it all away for one more minute of time. Mm. I cannot pay someone else to die for me. You gave of your most valuable thing, time to, to your friend and partner and, and, and all the rest. And you cannot value someone's time. Someone put these other five quids and 10 quids and how they are meaningless in, in that journey of time because we could be dead a minute later you didn't yeah. know you're going to die a minute later. You gave your most valuable thing, and your your partner and your best friend recognized that and was say, invested as much in it as you were. We're eating cornflakes. We're in a room watching Netflix. It doesn't matter if it's a big house or a small house. You're spending and investing in the most important thing on the planet: time with someone you love. Yeah, because it, 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 there's only 24 hours in every day. You can't. You can never say, "Hang on a second, I'm going to grab another few hours for today." You can't do that. Yeah, and. So time is a really, really powerful currency. But all my other friends didn't see that. They just saw that 
Matt was helping me financially. There, and, and I was giving nothing of it. No, Even no, Michael, we well, touched on it. And George will jump in here because he's a yeah. coach and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. They were it. never your friends. friends. They were your That's acquaintances. It. What they were was jealous and not wanting you to win when they were losing. They weren't yeah. stepping in like him when you they found you in the situation you were well, in. No, they might have had a point yeah. with you. So your real friend was... No, 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 no. no. I, I, this is the problem, was These were my friends. Oh, you're talking about and, and I still, yeah. and I still <laughs> don't I still don't think badly of them yeah. for what they taught. Because, That's their um, failings, not yours. They're, 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 yeah, so I don't see it as a failing, but fortunately I was strong enough yeah. when I lost a bunch of these friends that I had, had I, I'd um, gained a huge amount of strength in me that when that happened, it didn't rupture me, which a couple of years previously... I could have gone out again and having another go and third yeah. time lucky yes. I was committing suicide. But I didn't do that because I had an inner strength with me. I had a big cry and sadness at a, for about a day, but then I had to go and do a film. I had to do, uh, you know, that thing, uh, Uptown Funk by um, oh, yeah. Bruno Mars. Oh, yeah. And the following day, I had to fucking do a, dram- a dramatised version of that. Having the previous night found out that all my friends thought this of me and I was bereft when it happened. Yes. Still, yeah. I had to do it in the morning and get... It never learned the lines. I had to try and fucking. I couldn't learn the lines because my mind was so fast. It's very simple, the George. They were takers, not givers. They were. Yeah. They, they're friends, yeah. well, but I not in the real sense of the word. I found that out. Yes, that I that um that they were different. They looked at life differently yeah. to me. Even though I still think they're nice and good people, they just didn't see. Life the way I saw it, I suppose. That's no, I, I'm yeah. actually, I don't, we didn't know what this conversation is going to be about. I have no, no, no. clue well, who the hell you were and we're going to get on to this <laughs> and very deep stuff. I'm trying to sit here and go, how do I rip a new one in the room? How do I make this a little bit humorous? But then we bring in a bit of business, business coaching, life yeah. coaching. No, you've actually done it from the very, very beginning of the show. This is your show. It's not our show. Yes, You've absolutely. actually... <laughs> you've, you've, you've brought back life and meaning to us and the term friendship and and under and reminding us why we're doing a little bit of what we're doing ourselves and going our journey will be more successful if we can figure out how to give more rather than take more. Yeah. if we can give more than we take yeah. then yeah. the journey so has a better it, chance of it all comes around you know and what's happening is there's too many people and what they do is they take anyone who's a billionaire yeah. has taken and taken and taken and taken yeah. because they don't need that money and you know, the old time, even during the famine times, people still gave up the tiny little bit of food they had. They gave it to people, you know, while people who were rich kept on hoarding it and kept on saying, we want more from you, even though people had nothing. I went to see Arach. I go and see all the Irish films. And Arach was the same. The, the uh, landlord wanted more, but he says, we don't have it. And he says, it doesn't matter. We have to get it or we're going to throw you out of your house. But that's the only yes. place we can live. We've nothing to give. Our, our potatoes are rotted. How can you say you want it? I want this. No, that's, you know? yeah. well, yeah. that's a weird. Yeah. We're going back in time, forward in time. I'm even thinking of some of the billionaires that they've all signed up to this new, uh, you know, give it all away. But again, the giving it all away is into these massive trusts that keeps on giving, but we're not too sure where. They still seem to have more than they started with. And therefore, I, it, it's, I think it's what not I, visible to us. What, what was interesting was the fact that um, I think where, where, where I'm finding myself at this point in life is that if it's, it's being, to, for, it's having the power to give, is if you've got the power to give, then then you're wealthy. But if you're being robbed of your time by other people demanding of you and not giving you uh, um, the option to give of your own free will, that's where I think a lot of things are, are going wrong, you know, in in the world. And I know at the moment that um, I'm happy to give as much as I, you know, as long as I'm freely able to give that kind of uh, gift. But if I feel as I'm being robbed of my time by somebody else demanding of that, and when it seems as though, uh, you know, you know that it's, it's a form of abuse, they are just taking and taking. You just then feel... It's taken for you're granted. Being, it's, it's taken, it's taken for, for granted, granted, yeah. You know, and you do, and you, your lines. energy level just, just disappears mm-hmm. as well. If you can give freely, I think you can find all this wealth of energy erupts out of you and and, it, and you get refurbished and re- rejuvenated. But if you, if it goes the other way, you actually just feel that your energy is being cut out of you and, and you can't find the resources within you to to do the things that are being asked of you. I think that's that's one of the things. So it's a beautiful yeah. gift. that it's a, it's a beautiful gift in you sharing this story with us. 
And I think, the, although it may not seem comical, I think there's a there's a really interesting story, especially coming up to Christmas as we are, uh, that you're actually able to give us, which I think is absolutely wonderful. We are probably going to have to start to, uh, I've got this little thing in my ear saying, battery low, battery low. I think I, it's given as much as it can possibly give me at this point before the energy goes out of it. But I think it's it's, it's been a... It's actually been a beautiful story. Uh, I, I've, I'm, I feel really privileged to have had the honor to have you share that with us today. And, and it was a gift that you gave us by coming on the show today. And I think that's absolutely wonderful. I'm actually not going to give a summary like I normally would do. I think that's, um, I think people should listen to this show and listen to the, the wealth of, of giving that's coming in there, especially as we come up to that kind of Christmas period to, 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 to give you a proper honor there, I think. So any last words, Garvin, you'd like to just mention just before we wrap up? Oh, you're talk- Yo, you normally talk it to Michael, then to me. So Michael, well, I, I'm, actually, I'm, I'm actually going to ask Michael to wrap up for us today. I think. That's All right. Well, be, I'm going to just harp yeah. back a little bit and go the couple of words that came to mind. And actually, so it's, it's power, power of love, the power of giving, and then you mentioned energy there, George, and energy and power. There is, yes. When your energy is low, your power is low. Your power, you have the energy to give. You have the energy to love. We need stronger batteries. We need Tesla batteries. We need to be empowered to pa- have the power to give and love. And, and so, and love giving even better. So, and, and I think if we get the love giving, we get the most back. And that's what we suddenly realized to be in that position to have the power to give. We're in a very, very nice place. And I, I want to be in that position. I don't know where it is or when it is. And it might only be small things and big. It doesn't have to be a big thing. It can be a small thing. But you said it. <clears throat> we need to step up. We need to pay it forward. We can't expect things in return and give help, even if it's not asked for. Force it down the throats. So, Michael, as this is the part, last part, I, I want you to have the last words. So what, what would you like to say to our audience as, as a sort of parting gift? A, a simple par- parting gift is that if you're going to do something, ask yourself, are you being kind? You know, when you're going to talk to people or you have to answer a phone or you have to go into a shop and you have to do something, when you're dealing with a person, am I going to be kind? And kindness is the simplest thing to do. It, 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 if you give with kindness and even when you're giving or not giving, or if you're just going in to talk to somebody in a shop, go in with a bit of kindness in your heart. Try and just go in, have that kind of kind. You know, kindness is, is probably the most important thing that we give because we, if we, in our minds and if, in our hearts, if we're going in, living our life, just try and be kind to the person who you're talking. Don't be giving out or saying, oh, it's this, is that. Or, just be kind. I like that. And thank, and I like the you. word ki- is kindred. By definition, you just made a new friend. Absolutely. Absolutely. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for listening to the show, and we look forward to uh, being with us next time. I I did one. You can cut this out at the end. Um, I did uh, James, played James Connolly back in 2016. So I'm going to send you a photograph of me as James Connolly, which was the biggest thing I've ever done because when it was a two-hander, 45-minute show, and uh, me and a fellow called Declan Brennan, he played Pierce, I played Connolly. But the president asked us to put it on in his house up in Orsonuk Drive. You couldn't write this stuff. Oh, no, you couldn't. You they couldn't. Don't. And it was just absolutely <clears throat> brilliant, you know. Uh, he had the author of the piece there, um, Eugene McCabe, who unfortunately died last year. Uh, but his author, the author was there with his wife. His, what is, is, uh, Michael D was there with his wife. Tom Hickey, all his friends were there. And we did it in Orsonuk Drive, in that famous room. And... Uh, I'd send you a photograph as me as James Connolly. You just won't know me. That's all I'm going to say. This week, folks, we've had uh, this week, folks, we've had Michael O'Sullivan on our show telling us his wonderful story. So again, thanks everybody. We we're going to keep that little bit in because that's that's an important part of it as well. So thanks very much, Michael, and thanks everybody for listening to the show. God bless. Thanks. Bye for now. Bye bye. Hope you enjoyed this video. Please subscribe and click on the bell for notifications. 